Hello everyone, today's video is for Reese Colette, so let's jump right in. Placental mammals are organized into four superorders, Aphrotheria, Xenarthra, Laurasiotheria, and Euarchontoglyra. Today, we're concerned with the Euarchontoglyres, containing tree shrews, colugos, primates, rodents, and lagomorphs. As methods for determining phylogenetic relationships have progressed, this mammalian superorder has undergone a number of revisions. For starters, it was originally hypothesized that tree shrews and colugos were members of the now-defunct clade Insectivora, which existed as a wastebasket taxon for pretty much any small insectivorous placental mammal. It also included elephant shrews, golden moles, and tenrex, all of whom are now Afrotherians, as well as shrews, moles, and hedgehogs. The latter three now comprise the revised clade Eulipotypha, which is nestled within Laurasiotheria. With tree shrews and colugos now members of Euarchonta, phylogenies have favored colugos as sister to primates, with tree shrews basal to both. More recently, tree shrews have continued to move about the Euarchonta glyra tree. In some phylogenies, they are placed as sister to glyra, the rodents and lagomorphs, while others have found them to be sister to all Euarchonta glyres. More data is needed to robustly place them. Sister to Euarchonta is Glyra, which bifurcates into Rodentia, which includes the rodents, and Lagomorpha, which includes all the Lagomorphs. There is a common misconception that rabbits and hares are rodents. They are Lagomorphs, not rodents. Both rodents and Lagomorphs do have canines and have ever-growing incisors, but one major difference between them is that Lagomorphs have two pairs of upper incisors, while rodents only have one pair. Nevertheless, the close relationship between them has been robustly upheld in a number of genetic studies. The order Rodentia, or rodents, is the most diverse order of mammals, and they include squirrels, chipmunks, mice, guinea pigs, chinchillas, porcupines, etc. Lagomorpha, on the other hand, is split into two families, Ocotonidae and Leporidae. Ocotonidae is the family of Pikas tiny mammals from the mountainous regions of western North America and Central Asia, and Leporidae are the rabbits and hares. But these aren't the only glyres that have ever lived. There were two important, albeit likely paraphyletic, groups of early glyres called Eurymylidae and Mimatonidae. Just like rodents, Eurymylids also had only one pair of upper incisors, and they were often aligned with them, but they lacked the specialized cheek teeth that rodents have. Conversely, Mematonids had two pairs of upper incisors like lagomorphs, but unlike them, they also had two pairs of lower incisors, which is a more ancestral condition. Mematonid molars are also typical of ancestral mammals, not like those of modern lagomorphs. Because they lack many of the derived traits that make modern rodents and lagomorphs so different from each other, mematonids and eurymylids are very similar so similar that their exact position at the base of gliers is very fuzzy. In 2005, Asher et al. concluded that Eurymylidae is paraphyletic to both rodents and lagomorphs, in that some members, like Eurymylus, are closer to lagomorphs, and one genus, Cynomylus, lies outside the crown gliers clade. Eurymylids and Mematonids are just another example of intermediate forms that blur the distinction between two modern groups. Mematonids are likely the earliest stem lagomorphs that date to the Eocene. These include Gumphos, Mematona, and Mimolagus from Asia, which is largely considered the place of origin for lagomorphs. When we move on to stem lagomorphs that are closer to the crown of the group, we see the loss of the second pair of lower incisors and the acquisition of additional cusps on the premolars, making them more like normal ones. Within the crown lagomorphs, the Ocotonids, or Picas, retained a three-cusp premolar, while the premolars of leperids are all four cusps. This molarization of the premolars allowed for better grinding of plant matter, which aided lagomorphs in their strict herbivorous diet. Like other herbivores, lagomorphs uh, have to break down large amounts of cellulose in their digestive system. Vertebrates don't produce the necessary enzymes on their own, 
so they harbor microbes in certain areas of their gut, where cellulose is digested via fermentation. Ruminants are well known for being four gut fermenters, where fermentation happens inside of one of the four chambers of their stomach. But lagomorphs are hindgut fermenters. Although other hindgut fermenters, like horses, ferment their food inside their colon, fermentation in lagomorphs happens inside their large cecum. However, there is a problem. The cecum is almost at the end of the digestive tract. Once the cecum is done fermenting, the material passes through the colon and is subsequently defecated. So, to extract the maximum amount of nutrients that were just made available, lagomorphs first defecate the contents of the cecum as soft, moist pellets called cecotropes. Yes, it actually has a specific name. These are immediately ingested and the contained free nutrients are easily absorbed. The same material doesn't get processed in the cecum twice. Once all of the nutrients are extracted, it goes straight to the large intestine and is excreted as small, dry droppings, which the lagomorphs don't eat. Well, apparently eating your own feces is one viable workaround solution for the inadequacies of the mammalian digestive system to digest cellulose. Although, is it honestly any better than chewing on your own barf again and again? I wonder how intelligent design proponents would explain all of this. Anyway, let's continue. Now we turn to Leporidae, the family of rabbits and hares. Leporids likely also originated in Asia and spread to North America in the Oligocene, culminating in forms like Paleolagus. The legs of these earliest leporids were far too short for hopping, indicating that running is the ancestral condition. By the Miocene, leporids had radiated into South America and Africa, and their diversity peaked during the Miocene to Pliocene transition, at roughly the same time when many pika genera became extinct. In a paper published in 2013, G. et al. noted that pikas strongly prefer to eat C3 plants, while leopards include a lot of C4 plants. They concluded that the ability to eat C4 plants contributed to the size increase and range expansion of leopards. Furthermore, the dramatic expansion of C4 plants and the spread of open grasslands during the late Miocene, an event called Nature's Green Revolution, was likely the main factor that drove the extinction of pikas, and inversely promoted diversification of leporids. Although, once the Miocene had ended, leporids also experienced a drastic decline in diversity. One proposed explanation for this decline is that, since leporids were likely filling the same ecological niche as grazing artiodactyls, such as deer, they were likely outcompeted by them when they diversified. Although, Leopards still have a wide distribution. They have been introduced to Australia and Oceania, where they now wreak havoc on the local wildlife. Good job on us. On to their modern systematics. In the same way that toad and frog are not monophyletic distinctions within Anura, hare and rabbit are not monophyletic within Leporidae. For instance, most hares are placed within the genus Lepus, although due to the paraphyletic nature of rabbits, some hares are more closely related to certain rabbits, then those rabbits are to other rabbits. Lepus and Silvilagus, the cottontails, group more closely together than either is to Nisolagus, the striped rabbits. The only difference between rabbits and hares is that the former tend to be burrowers, while the latter tend to be fast runners. As a result, hares are born precocial, i.e. ready to move as soon as they're born. Confusingly, jackrabbit is synonymous with hare, not rabbit. Although rabbits tend to burrow, both rabbits and hares are agile runners, capable of quick bursts of speed to avoid predation, but one extinct rabbit was an exception. The giant Neurolagus is the largest known leopard, about 6 to 10 times heavier than the extant European rabbit. It lived on the Mediterranean island of Menorca during the Pliocene 5 to 3 million years ago. Its ancestors likely reached the island around 5.3 million years ago during the Mycenaean salinity crisis. This is when the Mediterranean Sea evaporated almost completely, if not entirely, after the Strait of Gibraltar closed. This connected the island of Menorca to the mainland, which allowed the ancestors of Neurolagus to colonize the area. Once the strait reopened, it caused the massive Zanclean deluge that refilled the Mediterranean basin and made Menorca an island once more. Neurolagus became isolated and it consequently evolved features that are quite atypical among leopards. Its abnormal size is likely the result of insular gigantism, which according to Foster's rule, happens due to a lack of predation on an island. Furthermore, its hind legs were rather short and it had a short, stiff spine. 
This meant that it couldn't hop and didn't move very fast. The head of Neuralagus was also relatively small, including small eyes and ears, which likely meant its sight and hearing weren't as acute as that of typical rabbits and hares. So it wasn't as good at detecting predators and running away from them, but then again these were absent on the island. Neuralagus simply lost these defenses since it didn't need them, allowing it to become one very unique leopard. So, that's the rabbits, those adorable, long-eared mammals nested within our own superorder that have persisted from the early Cenozoic to today. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.